there's this huge shame put around debt. When a single mom goes to the grocery store and puts her groceries on a credit card, knowing that she can't pay that credit card off, we call that debt. But when a rich person takes out debt, we call it leverage. And we put them on the cover of magazines. Okay, Vivian, it is so interesting to me how you moved from being a stock market trader to doing content creation full time. It is such like two different worlds. How did that even happen? Yeah, it does seem a little different now that we're talking about it and saying it out loud, right? Um, so I started my career as an equities trader at JP Morgan. And that's, to your point, a fancy way of saying stocks. Mm -hmm. So it's not as crazy as what you saw in Wolf of Wall Street. Nothing yeah, because like that. that's all the reference I have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was mostly just sitting at a desk. Um, there were six monitors and I would do, you know, trades from my desk. It was busy. It was crazy. Sometimes people yelled, but it wasn't as bad as the movies. Um, and that was great for two and a half years. But I ended up leaving the industry and... When I got to my new job at BuzzFeed, I worked in strategy sales, so nothing to do with finance. And all of my new colleagues were like, Viv, you come from Wall Street. Like, what's the point of us being friends if you can't rebalance my 401k for me? <laughs> or which health insurance plan did you pick? Or are our, start, are our company stock options even worth anything? Mm -hmm. And I got so many of the same questions. I said, why don't I just put this on the internet? Because you guys are wasting my time. I've answered this question four times now. Let me send you a link. Yeah, literally. Let me send you the link. Um, and the very first video I put out was the middle of the pandemic, January 1st of 2021. And I basically said, I'm seeing a lot of people who have no credentials, who have no information and no education in this space, who are saying things like, put your stimulus check into Bitcoin or put your stimulus check into Tesla calls. And... Those stimulus checks were for rent and food. Mm. They were for necessity. So like, don't gamble with necessity money. That doesn't make any sense. And I was like, listen, I don't have a get rich quick scheme, but I can teach you how to be good with your money. It's not that hard. And that video ended up popping off. Three million views, had 100,000 followers by the end of the week. That's amazing. Did you expect such interest no. in finance? No, are you joking? Like. <laughs> Finance is so boring, usually. Yeah. And I think it comes with a bad rap that it's like very tough to understand. And there's a lot of jargon and it's really for old people and, you know, mm -hmm. that young people don't care. And I think there were so many myths and misconceptions, both from like pop culture, but also on my end that I was like, I don't think people are going to like care about this. Mm. But as it turns out, like these days, you have to care. Yeah. Because money impacts everything that we do from the house, the house or apartment we can live in, the groceries we buy, the clothes we wear, the trips we want to take, the school we want to go to. Like it affects everything. And unless you are planning on living off the grid in your own little cabin, chopping your own wood and like, you know, using solar panels that which how would you pay for the solar panels? Like <laughs> you need money and we need to talk about it. I want to go back to some of the points in your journey because it's so interesting to me that you walked into an industry like Wall Street. When I think about Wall Street, I think to your point, right, the wolf of Wall Street, I think men. How yeah. was it to be a young woman in that environment? Well, I'm not going to lie to you. When I showed up, the team was 30 to 40 men and me. In the room and you. And me. Oh. And the only other woman there, my luck would have it, ended up becoming my manager. And she, they really were going for the, the twofer on diversity because she was also an Asian woman. <laughs> um, and I felt so lucky because even though no one else looked like me, she looked like me. And for the first time, I could see myself belonging mm -hmm. in that room. Belonging to the society of rich people, mm -hmm. belonging in a high powered position where I was an important person because it's really easy to be like a little kid and like dream about being a doctor or an astronaut or, you know, whatever. But when you don't see 
anybody who looks like you achieve what you want, how, what, how, what makes you think you can do it? Where's Absolutely. the roadmap there? And so for me to see that another Asian woman had gotten to be exactly where I wanted to be, it felt like reassurance or just a word of encouragement that like, she's smart enough to do it. You can do it too. You know, to me, it's a huge part, uh, the whole aspect of exposure, because you can't believe in something you don't see. Of course. And um, I think that this is, I mean, your stars align to be able to walk into a place and yeah. see, you know, a future you. Yeah. But um, also in terms of money mindset, I think you mentioned somewhere in your book where when you walked in, you learned that rich people don't focus on saving. They're focused on investing and building their wealth. And I feel like it's very different than what most of us carry in our yes. minds in terms of money. How did your money mindset change when you exposed to that kind of environment? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, I had Chinese immigrant parents, very frugal, like clip coupons, we're looking for savings. And is that important? Yes. But we have such a narrative in our culture, like society generally, that like women are shopaholics or overspenders or you're bad with your money because you're irresponsible. And like you love to go to the department store and buy stuff you don't need. And like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. because that's only half of the money equation. Yes, you can cut back on all of those things, but we rarely talk about working hard so that we can make more money and then having our money work harder for us. And this was just so perfectly shown to me in my first job because all of these guys would be so blase blase about handing out their credit card. This was the best part of working this job, by the way. Every single day at lunch, somebody would be would get hungry first. It typically wasn't me because I never wanted to pay. And these that guys- That was the rule, if you get hungry first, you pay? Well, no, the rule was like, if you're the one who's like, yo, what are we having for lunch? Like, you got to pull up your credit card. Oh my, okay. <laughs> so what, you know, one of the older guys would always be like, what are we having for lunch? And, you know, they would wait till people started like saying stuff and you'd be like salad or we'll get, you know, a pita bowl or we'll get something, whatever. And once you would, once someone would say something that they wanted, they would be like, okay, that trades. Mm. That was like the line, that trades. They would pull out their credit card and give it to me. And then I would go and get lunch for the entire row or the team or the, like the group that had agreed to get lunch together. And I would be buying lunch for like four or five people every single day. And it was crazy to me because Oftentimes I was swiping these credit cards for a hundred, a hundred twenty dollars each day. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, do these people not care that we're spending 120 bucks on lunch every single day? And they've bought lunch four days this week. <laughs> like that's $500 right there. And that was crazy to me. And the craziest part was my not my boss, but my boss's boss, so like really senior guy on the desk was like, yo, Viv, just so you know, anytime somebody hands you cash instead of a credit card, you should pocket the change. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, back in the day when, you know, when I was a kid, when I was young, when I was your age, when my senior would give me a hundred dollar bill to go get lunch for everybody, if there was change and it was enough that I didn't think he was going to miss it, I would just pocket it. I love how it's like its own little, you know, society yes. with its own rules. The rules. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to do that. I was so afraid of getting fired. So I was like, I'm not going to do that. But these people didn't care about the extra dollar or two. They didn't care about an extra $10 or $20, frankly. Mm -hmm. For them, that was nothing. The incremental money to spend on that didn't matter because they were more focused on the thousands of dollars I have in my savings account right now, how can I get that out of my savings account as quickly as humanly possible into investments that are earning me big money? And how do I make my money work hard for me? That way I don't have to worry about these lunches. I don't have to worry about canceling my Netflix subscription to get the ad version. Like they don't mm -hmm. care. They want to make more money, not try to cut out every little thing that brings them joy in their life. Which I feel like is what you see online from these, you know, 
financial advisors gurus, or things like yeah, that, yucky. gurus, it always feels like they're taking away the little joy that you get throughout the day. You know, we're already like, this, it's hard enough to just be a human. You and I. Don't take away my matcha or my avocado. Yes. yes. You and I have heard the line because we are, you know, roughly the same age. Like mm-hmm. millennials can't afford homes because you like coffee and avocado toast. Like, are you joking? I did the math, okay? If It's not the avocado no, toast. Like if we went and got a coffee and bought a coffee every single day of a, an entire year, 365 days of coffee, $5 mm-hmm. a day on coffee. Roughly, it works out to be about $1,800, $1,900 each year. Where, where, do you know where I can get a home <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for a down payment of eighteen to $1,900? Because let uh. me know if you do. I I definitely will. Um, Uh, It's crazy. mm -hmm. Like this rhetoric that our little treats are what's holding us back financially is just false. And it's kind of what's keeping us playing small. And I think that there's a lot of for millennials and for uh, Gen Z's, there's a lot of these misconceptions out there, right? That we carry. What other ones do you feel you see all the time and you just want to be like, stop, this is not a thing anymore? You know, I think one of the biggest ones is that all debt is bad. Ulta? All debt. Oh, I was like, Ulta, the where you buy makeup? You're like, please (laughs) don't tell me this. Oh, all Um, debt. Okay. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I think like there's this huge shame put around debt. Like if you have debt, you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. You're irresponsible. You're stupid. That's not true. Debt is not bad. Debt is not a swear word. And the only example and the only justification you need to know this is true is that we use a different word for rich people versus poor people. When a single mom who is having a hard time making ends meet goes to the grocery store and puts her groceries on a credit card, knowing that she can't pay that credit card off, We call that debt. We wag our finger and we say, you're so irresponsible. What a bad mom. What a bad parent. You're so lazy. You should get a better job. We see all these horrible things. Mm -hmm. But rich people love debt. I'm telling you this. as a, I consider myself a rich person. I have a mortgage on my home that is seven figures. Yeah. Seven figures of debt. Mom probably took out $100 on that credit card and we're making fun of her. I have seven figures of debt. Mm -hmm. But when a rich person takes out debt, we call it leverage because it allows them to have their money in two places at once. And we put them on the cover of magazines and we say, look at this visionary. Look at how smart they are to use debt as a tool. I get it. One of them is to afford a necessity and one of them is to make more money. But like, It's really, really challenging the way we talk about what regular people should do and what rich people actually do. And debt is not bad. Debt is a resource. Debt is a tool, just like everything else is. And we shouldn't shame people for using it. That's amazing because it it makes me think about what other terms that we use that are kind of limiting our access and ability to see where we can put our money, how we can advance in the financial aspect. Um, And it takes me back also to my childhood because I grew up also in an immigrant household. Mm -hmm. Um, My mom immigrated like two, three times. And money to me was always a bit of like a source of evil. So it- Talk to me about that. Yes, it was really interesting. It was always like in my household- my mother was always the one who was pushing. She was always like, okay, we need to go, you need to get a better apartment. We need to get a couch. We need to get, you need to go get lessons. So she did what she needed to do in order to achieve those things. Yeah. On the other hand, I had a stepdad that was just always like, we're going to end up on the street. There's nothing to eat, you know, and the environment was also of debt, yeah. Everything was that. And actually back, I grew up in Israel. And in Israel, um, I think, I guess here they do the same, right? When you go to grocery store, you can pay with payments. You can split like your bill in payments. I don't know. Can you do that? I, I, guess I don't know you if can. it's in the US. So I know you can't do it in person, 
but I know that there are now places where you can like pay in installments online. Yeah, exactly. So that, but with literally every single thing. Yeah. So you can imagine that that obviously created this false idea of access uh, to money and you just kind of put it everywhere. So it's literally was an environment of we're always in debt. It's always going to end. We're about to be on the street. And although my mom created Um, you know, an environment where I felt like I had everything I needed, I, in a way, started being, moving, like dissociating myself, I guess, from this idea of money. Mm. And thinking back at it now, like I don't have, I only recently, not recently, but in the past, I would say maybe 10 years since I started um, dating my husband, where I've learned to appreciate money, to value money, to look at money in a different way. Before that, I was just kind of ignoring it. I'm like, I don't think about it. You know, whatever comes, comes, whatever yeah. goes, goes. And it came from a place of fear because yeah. I didn't want it to control me because I saw how it controlled so many people around me when I was a child in a negative way. With, you know, it wasn't necessarily frugality that scared me. It was the being irresponsible like everyone was so responsible around me with money and it took me a long long time to break away from that for you growing up in your household you mentioned that you know it was about saving everywhere you could you walk into the situation where you start seeing okay the terms I've used are not relevant the ways I went about money is not it's not applicable to me anymore. How did you, what are the steps you started taking to yeah. really change that narrative for yourself? I have a horrible story to share with you. Okay. Um. So I was a big saver and I saved all my money. And my first year in New York, I lived in a studio with another girl. So like, it was like a glorified dorm room. We would like sit up and we would like look at each other, Charlie and the chocolate factory style. Um, But we lived well together. And then the second year, we moved downtown because we thought we were cool girls. And we ended up moving into a roach-infested apartment. Mm. Delicious. I know. (laughs) Horrible. Uh, We ended up paying $8,000 to break our lease. Wow. So it was $4,000 from her, $4,000 from me. And that $4,000 was pretty much every dollar I had saved over the past year. And to be a year into working and feel like you are no financially better off than when you started is such a horrible feeling. Imagine just treading water for a year. I don't have anything more than when I came to the city. I'm not any better off. I'm, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't have anything more. And that was when I was like, oh, I like really need to change my life. It was your aha moment. It was like a really low point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, felt like rock bottom. I was living paycheck to paycheck. People, nobody believes this. When I started my job on Wall Street and I came to New York, I came to the city with the money that the company gave me for my relocation bonus. So that was like money that I was given to deliberately move. I moved. I got an apartment. You know, I did all the stuff. I was living paycheck to paycheck before the first bonus came in because my rent was high. Cost of living in New York is very high. And I wanted to go out on weekends. I was young. I was in my early 20s. I wanted to have a good time. And over that year, I slowly scrimped and saved and scrimped and saved until I had that $4,000. And then it was gone. And for, it wasn't even like I spent that $4,000 on a vacation I got to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I spent it breaking my lease. And that sucked. And I'm very lucky in that throughout this whole period, you know, my mentor, my manager at work had been telling me to put money into like my 401k or whatever. But I was like, I need to do more than that because I don't ever want to feel the way this apartment has made me feel ever again. Mm -hmm. I felt so helpless, not just because I'm afraid of bugs, but that feeling of like someone has backed me into a corner. I can't get out of this lease. I was rented a shitty apartment that they knew had a bug infestation. And now I'm the one paying for it. Mm -hmm. And so I really started then and there working my way back up. I first and foremost 
ratcheted my emergency fund back up. So I had to save a little bit more over time. I made sure typically my rule of thumb for most people is three to six months. I had three months and then I was like, okay, now I can move on. Fortunately, I didn't have any debt. I will say it's a huge privilege and I acknowledge my privilege in many videos when I talk about student debt. I went to the University of Chicago. I got a merit scholarship because I was a really good high school student. So they just basically give you money for being smart. I got private scholarships through a bunch of things I applied to. And then my parents helped me pay for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. For parents who were coupon clippers and savers, giving me a private school education that in total, you know, obviously I had scholarships, but like that education was a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. They, that was blood, sweat and tears money that they put into my education. So I feel very grateful. I didn't have any debt, but I would say for anybody who needs the roadmap, it's get that emergency fund, then pay off any high interest rate debt. So first and foremost, credit card debt. I didn't have any. I moved on to the retirement piece, R. So this is my strip method, savings, total debt, R is retirement. I had my 401k. I opened up a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. And so I'm putting money away for retirement. Then I made this mistake and I don't want anyone else to make it. I invest. It's not enough to put money into your 401k. It's not enough to put money into your Roth IRA. You have to buy stuff. Otherwise, it just sits in cash. Right. So then I bought things. So index funds that track the S&P 500. I bought sector funds in tech and real estate because those were spaces that I felt like were doing well. I bought target date retirement funds in my 401k. So they would essentially change as I got older to become less risky. But since I was young, they were still pretty aggressive. I was making a good return on them. And then P of my strip method is plan. I took a long, hard look in, my, in the mirror and I was like, you don't want this apartment situation to ever happen again? What's your plan? How are you going to prevent this from happening? Mm -hmm. What is your career trajectory that you are going to be able to make more money, get a nicer apartment, have a better life? And I had to sit down with myself and think about that. And it's not always a nice conversation. I feel like it's a very scary conversation yeah. because even when you're at a low point, you already know how it feels and it's more comfortable, quote unquote, to stay there, to sit there. Cause you kind of know, like it's not happening. yeah, well, literally my yeah. money mindset. Yeah. I was like, yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I got lucky because I was earning money in my career and it paid for food and living. And then I met my husband. I was still young. I got married. So I kind of went into, you know, already, uh, into a life that was kind of set up, but for a lot of women, that's not the case, right? A lot of us, um, not a lot of women just don't really understand how to even go about it. And what I love about what you just shared, your your plan that you expand and talk on uh, in your new book, Rich AF, um, is those steps, like those actionable items that you can take. You know, you explaining those to me, it sounds like you need to have a lot of capital to even get to that first or second step. But tell me, like, if I really look into this emergency fund, like, how does it look like? Could it be $3,000? Can it be $4,000? So your starting point can be literally whatever you need it to be. Um, it's really based on your expenses. So you can have a bare bones three months and a very luxurious nine months whatever you feel comfortable with. And that's like a range, right? So bare bones three months is like, what money do I need for rent? What do I need for groceries? What do I need for transportation? And that's it. Then you can have a nine month emergency fund that's like, I cover my rent, I cover my groceries, I cover my transpo. But I also cover things like mm -hmm. my Netflix subscription, my kids dance lessons. These are all things that you can plan for in advance. Because what an emergency fund really does is it buys you time. Mm. So the reason we have these is if we get laid off, if we get hurt, if something happens so that we cannot earn money for that amount of time, that money bridges the gap. So you don't have to take on additional debt. And that's really helpful, especially in this environment where people do get laid off. People who are incredibly smart, incredibly talented, and do not get fired for a reason – they can just get laid off. These, this emergency fund 
buys you enough time to job hunt and find a new place to get paid to once again start building back up that emergency fund, I will say this is something that you need to recalibrate every few years, if not more. Because my emergency fund when I was a single gal living Mm. with my roommate and my expenses were low, you know, my rent, I think my first apartment, my rent, the reason why we agreed to live in a studio together, my rent was only $1,600. Um, you know, I was barely buying groceries because I was getting lunch covered for me at work. <laughs> I was thinking we, we, about yeah, that guy. We're like, a, he paid for lunch. Um, you know, I would just have a small dinner, whatever. My other expenses on that, I would say, were like a train ticket home for the holidays. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. Now, I have a mortgage, and that's a little scarier than renting because that home can be repossessed. I have rent. So I have my mortgage for New York, my rent in Miami. I have more expenses now because I have a business. Mm -hmm. So like my business has its own separate emergency fund to make sure that I can keep making payroll. I've got, you know, a partner. What if he gets out of work or like he gets laid off? I still have to be able to cover his food, his living, his stuff. In the same way that he's probably thinking the same thing about me, like, oh, if for some reason there's a lull in Viv's business, I have to be able to cover those expenses for her. And your emergency fund will likely get bigger as you get older, especially when you have kids, especially when you have a pet, especially when more and more people count on you. Mm -hmm. But whatever that means for you, change it every couple months, change it every couple years so that it fits your lifestyle. That emergency fund is not what you use to invest, right? No. That's a different... Okay, no. I'm just taking it back. We have the basic, your ba- bare bones, yes. correct? You have the emergency fund, and then you have the access that you invest. Correct. So okay. your emergency fund should be kept in a high-yield savings account. It's basically a traditional savings account, but you earn more interest. Mm-hmm. Why would you not want more interest? Right. Imagine if I'm like... Hey, Valeria, you can give me $100, and at the end of the year, I'll give you $0.46, cents, or at the end of the year, I'll give you $4.50. Which one would you want? $4.50. Yeah. Exactly. So it's the same thing with your bank, right? Mm-hmm. You are able to just get more interest at a high-yield savings account than you would at a traditional savings account, um, and it's just a great way to make your money earn money for you and essentially keep up with inflation. None of that is to be touched for investing. Because investing, we're doing it for the long haul. 85% of day traders lose money over a long-term period. Interesting. Investing is not the same as trading. Mm -hmm. We are not buying and selling things over a period of a day. We're not doing it over a period of a week. And we're not doing it over a period of months. Investing is for years. And there are less risky investments that you can invest in if your time horizon is five years. There are more risky things that you can invest in over 40 years. But the higher the risk, typically the higher the reward. So we have to be really mindful about timeline Mm -hmm. because it all comes down to this. It's not about money. Everything when it comes to finances comes down to time. Okay. Expand on that. I love that. That's, you see, that's a mindset shift. That's what I'm looking for. Cause I feel like we're all stuck on the surface, Yeah, but there's more. So take me deeper. The biggest myth is that you have to have a lot of money to be an investor. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Now, this is not the age of our parents' generation. You don't need hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars to invest. You can start for as little as $1 because you are now able to buy something called a fractional share. So a share is essentially, I'm trying to like do this for the camera. Mm -hmm. A share is a teeny tiny sliver of a company, right? Or something. And a fractional share is a teeny tinier slice of that one share. And you are now able to do that. So is that a recent development or was that yeah, always around? I would say that's like probably in the past decade or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, may, it means that if you want to buy something and the share price is $300, you can still buy it for $5 and you just won't have a full share. You'll have a fraction of one. And that's mm-hmm. great. It allows you to get invested early and often. And that is the benefit because compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. It's essentially saying 
you are able to use the money that you have to make you more money. And the money that you earned off of your money can then continue to make more money over time. Mm -hmm. So it's like an exponential growth curve, right? Everyone thinks that you need to somehow, you know, I'm thinking of that Zach Galifianakis meme that where he's like looking at all the math and the numbers oh, yes. and like be like a genius and like pick the perfect investment. That's not true. When I worked on Wall Street, hedge funds blew up all the time. They had a lot more resources and a lot more time and a lot more brains in this space working on this one trade idea than you will ever have access to. Mm -hmm. They still got it wrong. But it has been shown that if you invest in a diversified portfolio over a period of 40 years, the odds of you not losing money are greater than 99%. Those are not losing money, okay? Great odds. But the odds of you tripling your money is 95%. Right. Like, those are great odds. Mm -hmm. That is not gambling. That is making a calculated decision. And so my advice is that don't focus so much on the exact dollar value you have to put in. Focus on how early can I start because the more time my money has to sit around to be invested, the more it can work hard for me. And sure, maybe you're listening to this and you're in your early 20s. You can only put in five, 10, $20, okay? Who's to say by the time you turn 30, you won't be making more at your job. You can then put in more money. Yeah. By the time you're 40, you can put in even more. By the time you're 50, you are just funneling money into these investments. And then that really sets you up for a really wonderful retirement when you turn 60. The reason why it's so important to invest early and often is because we're all chasing after something similar. It's how quickly can we get to our FU number? Should I break down what that is? I Yes, please. I loved that whole yeah. FU part. So yes, yeah. please expand. So an FU number is exactly how many dollars you would need to have invested earning you a return so that you could kick over your desk, tell your boss F you, <laughs> and never work a day in your life again if you don't want to. Yeah. It gives you choice. Exactly. Like, listen, when I retire, I'll probably still work. I'll probably sit on some charity board and like volunteer, whatever. But mm -hmm. I, I don't want to just sit on my hands. But I don't think you have to work for money anymore. Mm -hmm. And your FU number is calculated by doing this. Close your eyes and imagine your perfect year. You get to live in the house you want to live in. You get to buy the food and eat the food you want. You even get to take a couple vacations. You maybe help your kids through school. You pay for... Close your eyes, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're able to fund Rover's heartworm medication so he can run around and, you know, go to doggy daycare and do all of these things. Mm -hmm. What does that year cost? Everybody has a different number in their mind. Yeah. Okay. Then you take that number and you divide it by 0 0.04. That 0.04 represents 4%, which is a very conservative return on your investment. And you can get 4 to 5% right now at a risk-free high-yield savings account. Mm -hmm. So you know you can get that. Odds are good you'll get more, but 4 is very a conservative number. When you divide by 0.04, I love to joke, like for my friends who are not good at math, when you divide by a decimal, it gives you a bigger number. You will get a number, and that is what you will want to have invested so that the interest or capital gains or returns on your money are funding your lifestyle, and you will never need to work again. I love it. There's a formula, you guys. A little formula. formula. I, it's, it's not a, it's like, I love the idea of manifestation. Yeah. But it's not just, please let me be rich. Please let me be rich. Mm -hmm. It's, what is the formula? How can I get there? Because you can make every single one of your dreams come true. Yeah. But you have to have a plan to get there. Which I think is interesting. You know, I'm talking about, I found you on social media, yeah. obviously. And, you know, when I look at what social media represents today, because that is what the younger generation is exposed to. This is what we compare ourselves to. Um, and we see so much content of 20-year-olds that are, you know, being like, if you don't have a Lambo by oh the God. age of 22, you're doing it wrong. Um, and what I love about your work is that you are obviously very focused on financial freedom and literacy, but longevity. Yeah. 
And longevity is a huge thing. And that's another thing that not a lot of us talk about, exposed to on a daily basis, you know? So longevity is that formula. Longevity is to be able to work backwards from those numbers to be able to one day have that FU lifestyle, right? And I think there's something that, you know, we don't talk about especially when you have a career like you and me do, you don't get 40 years. Yeah. When you are a creator, when you are an influencer, when you run your own business, I'm sorry, but like we haven't even seen the full life cycle of what an influencer is. But from what I've noticed, you get five, maybe 10 good years Mm -hmm. where you can make a lot more money than the average job. But guess what? The average accountant works for 40 years. The average teacher works for 40 years. The average doctor, lawyer, firefighter, police officer, they work for 40 years. You and I and people who are running their own, you know, brands, you have to make the same amount of money that you would otherwise have made over a lifetime Mm -hmm. in a shorter period of time. And it's not about getting rich, baby. It's about staying rich. Yeah. And if you are not being smart with the oodles of money you're making right now, you are going to wake up in 10 years and think, oh shit, where did all my money go? And what, what skills do I even have now? Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to be able to be hired back at a traditional job unless you're willing to take a massive pay cut, go back to school or make some sacrifices. Right. And it's crazy to me because I have so many friends who are creators or influencers And I see some of the craziest behavior. Like what? I need real life examples. Like popping bottles at the club. I've seen a bill signed for $30,000 at the club. And I was like, I'm going to throw up. People who go on shopping sprees at Cartier, at, you know, Louis Vuitton, at Chanel, Dior, all of these designer brands. And they're not getting a bag. They're not getting a bracelet. They're not getting a watch. They're going in. And they're dropping a hundred grand. And I'm like, do you think this (laughs) money audacity? Like, I'm like, do you think this money falls out of the sky? Yes, but that's what I'm saying, right? There's this, again, especially with creator economy that created this image of like it's money that's literally falling off the sky, right? Everyone is working now to go viral and then swim in money. You see so many, I mean, OnlyFans. The 20-year-olds with the the Lambos, like, kill me though. Right. But even the OnlyFans girl, I mean, I am so, I read a story, an article a couple of months ago of this one girl, I don't even remember her name, but she took her money and bought real estate. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, that's what I want to see. So it's really about how you're moving with that money, how you're building that longevity. Um, and that to me is what makes me excited for the younger generation. But I have to say the landscape right now is still very juvenile with the approach to money, right? Super. Because what people don't realize is that especially when you're in that type of line of work, I would say that like, you know, I feel very fortunate in that like my brand is very education focused. Mm -hmm. So even when I get older, even when I'm don't look like this, like I know like people will probably still listen to me. Right. Mm -hmm. But like no shade to people who do OnlyFans, it is a very legitimate form of work. But like, mm-hmm. there is a timer like, on like, it. There's a timer on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Like, there will always be a hotter, cuter, mm-hmm. better, new it girl. And you get your moment, but you better make your moment count. Yeah. And there are people on there making what I make in a year in a day. Absolutely. And so I'm like, listen, more power to you. But with that money, There's a lot of responsibility because you're earning a lifetime's worth of money in a very short period of time. And if you are not smart, if you are buying liabilities and not assets, you will wake up with a bunch of stuff that you can no longer afford Mm -hmm. and have no idea where all that money went. Absolutely. So I want to navigate away from the OnlyFans. That's its own, you know. Lifestyle, even creator economy, its own thing. Let's yeah. go back to, um, you know, the majority of people that are yeah. working at 
offices and jobs yeah. and have like career, regular careers. I loved your point in your book about knowing your worth. Yeah. I think it is very important to know your work, uh, your worth in a workplace, but also knowing how to utilize it. Yeah. You presented a little system in the book. Can yeah. you share that one? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about my brag book. Well, that's one of them. You actually brought yeah. up a couple of things where I'm like, these are such amazing yeah. things to remember. So the first one was the red light, green light. Yes. Okay. So we'll go through them in the order that you want. Um, yes. Red flag, green flag is basically understanding the differences of like what in your workplace can and cannot be changed. So like I compare them to my two workplace scenarios. I didn't mention this earlier, but I left Wall Street because I had a bad boss. My initial manager, amazing. Love her. Still my mentor to this day. Dedicated the book to her. I love her. A year and a half in, the head of my desk got let go. And they brought in a new boss. He fired half the team and moved me to go work for his best friend. And this guy sucked. <laughs> he was so rude and so mean. And he didn't like things about me that were never going to change. He didn't like that I was a girl. He didn't like how my nails click clacked on the keyboard. He didn't like how I dressed. And that's not something that I was going to be able to change. Mm -hmm. I knew I was never going to get a fair shake because of who he was and because of who I was. That's a red flag. Whereas when I got to my job at BuzzFeed, there was certainly an inner circle of like cool kids, but they were the cool kids because they were the top performers. And all I had to do to get in that cool kid circle was be a top performer. And I was always really okay with being judged on the merit of my work. And so I was able to like essentially fight my way in to that inner circle. And suddenly everybody at the company was bending over backwards to help me make my deals work. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's good to know what you can and cannot change and what is going to make a deep impact on your experience, your pay, and your ability to essentially progress in your career. Absolutely. So that's first one of them. I would say another important thing is the brag book. I so love the brag book. Anytime anything good happens to you, typically a lot of us are working over email now. So make a little folder in your email, label it brag book, raise receipts, promo pitch, whatever, and then put the year. So it's, you know, it's early 2024. Just put brag book 2024. Mm -hmm. And now throughout this entire year, anytime someone sends an email and is like, wow, you're so amazing. Or this project couldn't have happened without you. You saved the team. Forward it to that email or forward it to that inbox in that little folder. And then when it comes for mid-year reviews or end of year reviews, typically the way it's worked for me is you get asked to write the most annoying self-review and you're ha you have to be like, these are three things I did amazing. And these are two things that I could improve upon. It's like, okay, sick. This sucks. <laughs> you're like writing a five paragraph essay for work. Um, use the folder. You now have a laundry list of everything you crushed and screenshots. I love that. It's so easy. Like you don't exhibit have- Exhibit A. Exhibit, exhibit A. B. Literally. <laughs> be like, please refer to this email. Like, you literally have proof. Mm -hmm. And the really important part about when you're asking for money and when you're asking for a raise is being able to point to numbers. Mm. I saved the team this many hours by creating a better system. I increased the social media following by XYZ. I wrote this many articles. I saved the company this many dollars or I earned this many dollars in revenue for the company. That's really what moves the needle. Yeah. And so when you have all those emails, it's a cheat sheet. It's literally a crib sheet for that write-up. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to search through your inbox. You're like, oh, I can't find it. Forget it. Like, you literally have all the proof you need. And that is how you make sure that every year you are able to ask for 10 to 15%. I'm not saying you get 10 to 15% every year, but if you don't ask, the answer is no. Absolutely. I think it's also an amazing exercise of, you know, working on your confidence and yeah. self-awareness, because I think that to your point, when I think 
about an exercise of sitting down at the end of the year and trying to come up with, you know, what I did great this year, you can play small. And I think a lot of us do in a way, right? It's, it's not something that comes naturally to most of us being like, listen, I made this company better, yeah. right? So having that kind of resource is wonderful. It's also something I would probably open up multiple times a week to just be like, yeah, I'm that girl. Like that's I'm that girl. I'm that girl, you know, just a reminder. And it goes back to that money mindset, right? Because we've been told that like asking for more money makes us greedy mm -hmm. or, you know, caring about money makes us gold diggers. That word doesn't fucking exist. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But like it's a job. Yeah. That, like I'm not here for my health. <laughs> like this is not a hobby. This We're is not, not a having hobby. fun. Like I, I mean, work here you. for money. Yeah. We have a contractual obligation. I do this, you give me money. Mm -hmm. Like that's the like it's crazy to me that people are like, you should be doing it for the love of the game. It's like the love of what? <laughs> I love sitting at home on my couch eating chips. I don't love working. But you know what? I think you are allowed to like your job. Mm -hmm. You are allowed to like your boss. But no, when you ask for money, that money doesn't come out of your boss's pocket. That money comes out of a business banking account that is set aside for labor costs. You deserve to be paid. I wish I met you at like 18 years old. <laughs> I mean, I wish I met me now at 18 years old because at 18, I wasn't confident. Mm -hmm. At 18, I wasn't so self-assured. I totally did not understand the value of my self-worth. Like, I mean, even at like 21, 22, I was like, oh, this boy texted me at 4 a.m. It must mean he likes me. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that's not what that means. My most limiting resource right now, again, it goes back to this. It's not money, it's time. Absolutely. I only have so many hours in the day. I need to get sleep. I need to rest. I need to eat. And like the very limited time I have now, I don't have time to fuck around. And that's something that money taught you. Yeah. You see, this is, this is one thing that I still need to get to. And I feel like my husband and I talk about it all the time. Gary's always like, you got to be more like cutthroat yeah, because your time worth so much and you are giving it away without even realizing it. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it comes from that feeling of guilt or don't want to bother other people. So it's still me, you know, battling with my own younger self. She's still in there doing her thing. But um, it's, I love that money made you realize all these things and gave you this confidence and awareness of how much you're worth and how to ask for it, which also brings me to the point of negotiating. Let's do it. So negotiation to me, I believe that it is something you're born with. And I know that <laughs> that's like, not the case. I was not born with it. And I'm, it's honestly on my to-do list. Like I would love to crush it at negotiation. I feel like I would be great. And actually in business negotiation, I, I can be more, um, you know, more aggressive, but it's the small little, like I always gave myself little projects of like, okay, I'm going to go to the market and I'm going to buy this trinket and I'm going to negotiate. It never works. I don't do well. What is like, what is that secret sauce for negotiation? The secret sauce is, are you willing to walk away? How does that work? In you have to really know your value in this one. And listen, <laughs> I get it. Negotiation is like, like yeah. I'm stressed, but I like, I want you to remember if you negotiate and they say, no, you are no worse off than you currently are. And two, you are willing to walk away because you know your value. Mm -hmm. Those are the two important things to remember. And I think a great example of this is that like rich people love to negotiate. It's these like are some of, these are some of the cheapest people I know. I'm like, God, you are really just like getting into it with like an 18 year old customer service rep over twenty three dollars. Like, is this really worth doing? But they love it because it is a sport. And even though they have the money to pay for it, they don't want to. Mm -hmm. So I would say some of the things that you should practice on, this is an easy one. Everybody has this, your cell phone bill. Okay. Oh. You're probably paying hundreds of dollars on that cell phone bill because we all have cell phones and we all need unlimited data and we all need unlimited, you know, calling and texting, whatever. Call your cell phone provider and tell them that 
although you're happy with the service, the monthly costs have just gotten to be a little too high and that you're considering switching to a competitor, that you'd like to cancel your subscription and to transfer you to the cancellations department. They're not transferring you to the cancellations department. Are you joking? <laughs> They're sending you to customer retention. So you're going to get sent to customer retention. And you're going to basically just going to do the same song and dance. You're going to do the same song and dance. Yeah. And listen, sometimes the customer service person's having a bad day and they're going to be like, fuck off. You can leave. Mm -hmm. You can hang up on them. They're not going to cancel your subscription. They're not going to cancel your plan until you say, yes, finally do it. They're not going to. Mm -hmm. It is not in like they are not allowed to do that. So what you're going to say is you're going to say like, hey, I'm happy with the service. What can you do for me? Don't be a yes or no question. Leave it open-ended. Let them talk. Just shut up and be quiet for a second. Because I am someone who very much feels the need to fill awkward silences. Sometimes you just need to let it be awkward for a minute. Mm. Let them fill it. Sometimes they're like, oh, well, we can give you the introductory rate for the next year, or we can do this, or we can do that, or we can give you the next three phones free, or like they'll do something for you. If you're happy with that, great. But we're not done. <laughs> We're not done. Even when you're happy, I'm not happy, okay? I want you to push again. Be like, great. Can you lock that rate in for two years? Don't want to have this conversation again because you don't like negotiating. Lock it in for two. Mm. Or, you know, just make it so that you know that you've taken two bites at the apple, okay? And if it works out, I probably just saved you a couple hundred bucks. In, in what, 12 minutes of time? Yeah. Maybe a couple hundred bucks in 12 minutes is pretty good use. In this economy? In this sure. econ it's a great use of your time. If it doesn't work, just hang up. Mm -hmm. And try again tomorrow. Try again tomorrow. <laughs> you are no worse off. You've wasted 12 minutes. Do it while you're on the treadmill. Do mm -hmm. it while you are cooking up breakfast. Do it while you are painting your toenails. Like, this is not something that needs to be stressful. It is something that you need to incorporate into your daily life. And just never be afraid to walk away. Know mm -hmm. the value of your business. Mm -hmm. My guess is you cover your phone plan for you, your husband, maybe kids. I don't know if they're old enough to even have phones yet. But Not yet, but it's coming it's up. It's coming. It's scary. They're getting them younger and younger now. I know. Um, you know, maybe you have business lines for your team, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like your business is worth something. You are worth something. And I think people forget that. They think that like if they're not J-Lo walking in with – $350 million to spend that they're chopped liver. Yeah. No. That's absolutely how I think. It's not because your business is worth something. Your business is valuable. You are, you are valuable. I had somebody DM me. They were like, oh, I really want to talk to a financial advisor, but I'm middle class. And the way she said it like made me so sad mm -hmm. because she said middle class like she was embarrassed of that word. And I told her, I was like, middle class means your needs are met. It means you still have money for discretionary expenses. You live a good life. You work hard and you deserve everything you have. It is an honor to be middle class. And any financial advisor you talk to, any certified financial planner, any accountant, any lawyer, any person who provides professional services that you talk to better treat you like such. Mm-hmm. Your business has value. You have value. Don't be afraid to ask for stuff. That's a big one. Because I think that is probably one of the biggest kind of roadblocks for a lot of people, right? We always feel like we need to be, me at least, we need to be at a certain place to earn a certain, you Respect. know, door opened. Do you ever wear like fancy clothes when you go shopping at a fancy store so that the customer service rep doesn't think like you're just like... Like what do you do here? You don't belong. Yes. Yes. I'm past that point in my life, but you need to be past that point in yeah, every other in aspect every of your aspect. life. You see, that's a good analogy too yeah. to keep in mind. I love that. I want to go back to you mentioned how your uh, emergency fund was one way when you were in your early 20s. Yeah. Now you are in a relationship. You recently got engaged. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not wearing my ring because I'm wearing all gold jewelry today. But um, right. yeah, I probably should wear it more. You can you can mix. Just saying. I know. I, but it's like, is it something for you're you? You're good at it though. Yeah, you just play around, you know? Yeah. It's possible. But now you are, you're newly engaged. Congratulations. Thank and you. I feel like money and relationships is also another area that feels 
very awkward. Yeah. People don't really know how to mesh the two, especially when you get together um, at a stage where you have a career, you already make money, you kind of understand where you're going, what you yeah. want to achieve. How did it go for you? Like, how did you, with your partner, sit down and walk through this, like, okay, these are my goals? Especially for you, you're like, I know where I want to be. Yeah. I was, I've always been like this. Like, I've always known where I wanted to go. But when we met, neither of us were making that much money. He made a little bit more than me. And over the next four years of our dating, he really advanced in his career and it started to take off. And at one point he was probably making like four times as much as I was. Mm -hmm. And I felt so grateful and lucky that he never made me feel bad about it. That's huge. We were never 50-50 partners. <laughs> I know. Equal. <laughs> no, ew. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, ew. Because I don't believe, I don't believe in equality. Absolutely. I not, in, especially not there. I believe in equity. Mm. Mm. And there's a huge difference. What's the difference? Equality is you and me, we're dating. Mm -hmm. You know, you make half a million dollars a year. I make $50,000 a year. We go 50-50 on our rent on our apartment. It's equal. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. Whereas equity is if you and I are dating, you make half a million dollars, I make $50,000, and you pay for most of the rent, and I pay for my portion. And it is prorated based on how much we make. Because it is then a comparable burden on our financial situations. Mm -hmm. It's the same percentage of your income as it is for me versus me paying way more rent than I can afford. Yeah. He always let us do that and never made me feel bad about it, never made me feel like I wasn't pulling my weight. He would pay for almost all of our meals with the exception of his birthday and like <laughs> special occasions where I would pay. So you didn't have to go through like an awkward... We, we did have to have a conversation because when I was at that roach-infested apartment... I was like, yeah, I'm so sad. I have a roach invested apartment. He let me move in with him mm -hmm. and I didn't pay rent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love it. But, you know, we've always had really big goals and we've been really transparent with each other about how much we make and how we are going to plan to get there. Over the past two, three years, things have really changed. I want to say three years ago, we made roughly the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. Over the past two years, now I probably make five times as much as he does. And that's not to say he doesn't make an incredible living. Mm -hmm. I just have a very unique opportunity right now. And now I pay for more stuff. And that's cool. Like we split our mortgage 50-50, but the rent in Miami, I pay entirely by myself. Mm -hmm. He doesn't contribute to that. He still pays for every meal because most of the time I'm too lazy to bring out anything but my cell phone. He's like, do you have keys? I'm like, no. He's like, do you have an ID? I'm like, no. I mean, that's why you have a, you know, a partner. Yeah. Like, I'm like, you, here you go. You got pockets? This yeah. dress doesn't have pockets. What am I supposed <laughs> to do? Um, he's like, okay, but like, you didn't even bring your ID. I was like, why do I need ID? He's like, what if something happens? I'm like, I don't know. They'll have your ID. Um, I'm always like that. I'm like, you know what? The universe would just do its thing. We'll figure it out. He always out. gives me a hard time too. He's like, for all the purses you've bought, you don't like to use any of them. He, I'm always like, can you put this in your phone, in your pocket? Like my phone in your pocket. He's like, but you know what? The day you'll stop doing it, he'll be like, what, what's wrong? Yeah. You don't love me anymore. Yeah, literally. You know? That's how it works. Yeah. So they're oh. deep down. They're very grateful. But did you have, um, a sit down? You had a sit down. You had an official sit down. Um, again, your character and the way you are, I, I can see how it went very kind of clearly. Uh, and again, especially when you guys are aligned on the goals that you want to achieve as a couple. But if you ever heard maybe your friend or any instances where those conversations just kind of don't go well, like what do people, yeah. how do people go about that? Like navigate? All the time. I think money is an incredibly touchy subject, but what you want to do is talk about it early and often. Again, back to early and often time, first date, you can ask about money. You just don't say, hey, show me your pay stub. Like <laughs> you, you go and you say, if money were not an object, what is your dream vacation? That gives you an insight into how they value money. Because some people are going to say, I would take a six-month backpacking trip down in Chile. Mm -hmm. 
that tells you something about how they value money. Money is for adventure, for experiences. Someone would say, I would spend two weeks lounging in Bora Bora, completely horizontal with a pina colada in my hand the entire time. For them, money is used to relax. If they say, I would take my entire family on a vacation to Disneyland and we would get the special tour guide that costs like 10 grand a day so we don't have to wait in any of the lines, it tells you that they use money for family. It tells you what people value. Money is just a medium of what mm. people value. Or, you know, say, I give you $1,000, what do you spend it on? I give you $10,000, what do you spend it on? It tells you exactly what they value. I love that. And that's first date. And also, you should probably discuss who's paying tonight. I am personally of the camp that whoever invites pays. No, stop it right now. Why? I don't like that camp. That camp is not Why? For you me. Think the Why? You think the guy should always pay? Yes. First date? Absolutely. Well, typically, I will say I had not think I've ever invited a man on a first date. Well, first of all, yeah. But even if you did, I just think that that's, I don't know. There's some, yeah. there's some aspect of... Chivalry. Yes. You know, like, show it to me. Give me... We start with that. Yeah. And then the rest can be, you know, figured out yeah. later. You know, I think for me... The first date, who invite pays, typically does err on the side of the man mm -hmm. in a heterosexual relationship. But I do want to be mindful because when my fiance and I started dating, we were both very young. Neither of us were making a lot of money. And I wanted to keep going on dates with him. Mm -hmm. And by date four, five, six, I didn't want this guy that I really liked digging himself in a financial hole just to be able to take me out. Because I, I could see that there was a surplus in my budget from all of those meals that he was paying for. So I was like, listen, like, I'm happy to cover meals every so often because, yeah. like, we are eating them together. And, like, we're spending a lot of time together. And eventually it became that, like, he would say, I will cover more of our expenses because I have more money coming in. You save and invest your money. And when we ended up buying our home together, I put in, I want to say, $100,000 more. Mm -hmm. But we are 50-50 owners on the home. But that's, that's a different level. That's partnership. Yeah, that's, that's true like partnership. That's a whole other, you know, and that I agree with absolutely. Um, but first date. They got to pay. They got to pay. You're like, I'm, I'm a special and you, gal. And you won't convince me otherwise. Um, you know what? I do want to talk about your book, Rich AF. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I got an early copy of it. Yeah. I got to read it. I read it in a matter of days. And I You're thought... You're a fast reader. I am a fast reader, but I was, was also so fascinated because it was so... You broke it down in such like a simple way. Um, it wasn't intimidating. It wasn't scary. It wasn't this like, oh my God, I have to now, you know, cut off everything I love and appreciate yeah. uh, so I can, you know, have some financial freedom. And I really adore you for putting that Ooh, out there you. in such a nice digestible way and I know it's going to be of so much value to young men and women that are out there in the world trying to navigate this insane financial economy that we have financial economy just an economy yeah. that we are part of <laughs> uh, so thank you what would you if you had to think of you know the the kind of jams and the lessons you want people to leave with after reading your book, what those would be? You are not bad with money. You just haven't been taught about it. This is not something we cover in our public schooling education. It's, I think it's a shame that we don't. Mm. But just because you don't know about money doesn't make you a bad person. And it's never, ever too late to learn. I think it is okay to acknowledge that the system is not fair that we need to be writing our legislators, that we need to be changing how certain systems are because they do disproportionately disadvantage women. They disadvantage people of color. They disadvantage the LGBTQ community. They disadvantage immigrants. They disadvantage people who are low income. Yes, that is all true. But just because the system isn't perfect or even good doesn't mean you can wipe your hands and say, I'm not going to play. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to play this game. You have to play. Because if you are of that community, if you are someone who isn't supposed to be rich, by participating, by becoming wealthy, by becoming financially stable, 
you are then able to help lift up people around you. And that is an act of love and self-care and rebellion all at once. Mm -hmm. And it is so important to know that you deserve to be rich AF because you are going to do something with that. When you are rich, it is not just a privilege to do something with that. It is an obligation. And by making sure that there are more dollars being put into women's pockets, into people of color's pockets, into all of those pockets, we are ensuring that that education and that money gets then filtered down through those businesses, through those families. And education is almost more valuable in this case than the money. Mm -hmm. Because if you know what you're supposed to do, you can make the money doing whatever. You can then use your money to make you more money. But this is the education we never got in school and we so desperately need. I had a question there where I wanted to ask you, do you feel like money buys happiness? And I feel like you kind of answered it with this. Um, Because it's not directly buys happiness, but it's the... I think money buys you the ability to be happy because... If you have money, Mm -hmm. your basic needs are met, and you have the opportunity to make choices in your life that bring you joy. You don't even have the ability to make choices that bring you joy if you don't have the bare minimum, the baseline, the basic needs met. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do think money does buy you the opportunity to be happy. We're back to that choice. You just want to have choices. You want to have choices. I love it. Vivian, this was so fun. I've learned so much, but I knew I'm going to learn so much because my whole book is highlighted. (laughs) Um, But the book, the episode will be out when the book will be already out. So highly, highly recommend to check out the book, Rich AF. You, I promise you, even if you think you know everything, you're going to learn some more. Um, And I had the, you know, privilege to have a husband that's very well versed in finance, but this really gave me another chance to learn small little nuggets and just even give tips to younger people around me, right? Because I have now all these phrases and all these concepts that you shared in the book, uh, but also made me think about my own money mindset. And, um, and I thank you so much for that. Where can people find you? Everybody can find me as Your Rich BFF all over social media. And if you want to order a copy of Rich AF, The Winning Money Mindset, that'll change your life, go to richaf.me. I made the URL a manifestation so that we can, you, you know. You did? Yeah. Richaf.me. Because me, that. I want to be Rich, rich AF. AF yeah. Which you are. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't miss my newest episode right here. And if you're listening to the podcast on Apple or Spotify, please go and leave a review with your biggest takeaway. I love reading your thoughts. And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics, you can leave them in the comment section. And always, always remember, you are not alone.